Good morning. Good to see you all here. Everyone's very welcome. And I trust the Lord will bless us as we have gathered out this morning at our family service. Let me, on your behalf, welcome uh, our preacher for today, our good brother, Jim Hudson, and also his wife, Sue. Sue is with him today. Jim has been over in the past week. We've been in two local schools uh, with the amazing journey for which we praise God for and Jem was leading up that word. So, Jem, you're very welcome. I look forward to hearing you a little later on. We're going to open our meeting uh, with a hymn from the chorus book, number 24, Christ the Triumphant Ever Reigning. And after the introduction, we'll stand and we'll sing this hymn together. Thanks, David. <laughs> Just before we come to prayer, uh, we're going to read a passage from the psalm, Psalm 39, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 39, reading verses 1 through 6. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle, while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. 
Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. Amen. Now we'll take a moment to come before God in prayer. And we'll remember as we pray, Colin Murray, who is at Sainfield Baptist today, Hugh Martin, who is down the avenue in Templemore Hall, uh, and Jane McKee, who will be at Victoria Hall in the Gospel this evening. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Almighty and eternal God, as we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would pause for just a moment to acknowledge and to consider who it is whom we come before this morning. You have revealed yourself in your word to us, our Father. And we read there that thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. This is the God to whom we come before this morning. And we come into your presence in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one by whom we have access into your presence. The Lord Jesus, your Son, in whom we have boldness, and confident access through faith in him. Thank you for that, <coughs> Heavenly Father. And as we consider him, we praise you for how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. We pray that you would hear our prayer this morning, O God. Bless us as we have gathered out together. We thank you for, indeed, this opportunity to come together again to the Iron Hall family service this morning on another Lord's Day to worship you for who you are and to praise and to thank you for your mercy and your grace whereby you have blessed us with many blessings each and every day. We thank you for all that we have from you in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would accept the thanksgiving of our hearts for these things in his name. Our Father, we thank you for all that has passed throughout the past week whereby you have been with us and blessed us and encouraged us. We thank you for the opportunity to once again take the amazing journey into two local schools. And we pray that you would continue to bless all that took place in those schools and those days. We pray for Jim. We pray that you would bless him as he continues to serve you in this ministry throughout the United Kingdom that he may know your continued enabling and empowering and blessing in this work. Now, Father, we are mindful too that the past week has been a difficult one for many in our assembly, and we commend these dear saints to you. We pray for all of those who have been ill, who are recovering, those, our Father, who have been recently bereaved, those who in any way have been through a difficult time, we pray that you would bless our Father according to each individual need. And so our Father, as a little later on, Jem takes a platform to open the word of God and to preach from it, we pray that you would bless him. Pray that he may know much liberty on the pulpit as he brings before us those things that he has prepared before you and with you. We thank to our Father uh, of those who have left us today to take the word of God elsewhere. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we have of sending uh, some of these men on occasion out to other places. We pray that today 
for Colin at St. Field Baptist, for her brother Hugh down the road in Templemore Hall, and for Jane McKee as he brings the gospel to Victoria Hall in Carrick this evening. Father, would you bless to your glory these brethren and the word that they would impart. So bless us in, uh, shut us in, our Father, with your presence. Bless us, we pray, in this coming hour, for we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Now, Trevor Pauly's going to come just now and speak to the children. Thanks, Trevor. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Uh, that's lovely to see you. Uh, maybe the first slide. Typical Northern Ireland. Uh, the first slide says snow, snow, snow. And this morning it's rain, rain, rain. But during the week, we had snow. Well, certainly if you live in Ballygowan, we had snow. I don't know as much about if you're right down into the middle of Belfast, but we had snow. Ballygowan tends to get lots and lots of snow. The next slide, this time round, well, in all honesty, we did not have enough to make a snowman. Much to my grandchildren's disappointment, the snow this time round mostly came at night and the next morning it was absolutely hard and icy. I got told off for throwing a snowball at my granddaughter. Well, she is four and she did complain that that was all ice. Granddad, don't be doing that again. But snow. We were looking out on Wednesday and Lorraine's mum was up for her tea and we're looking out, and Lorraine goes, it's snowing again. Lorraine does not like snow. Lorraine does not like driving in snow. So we had to get into the car to take Lorraine's mum back up into Belfast and home. And about two miles outside of Ballygown, no snow. So Ballygown does get quite a bit of snow. The next slide, the fascinating thing about snow is just watching it, especially if you're inside and the heat's on and you're looking at Aren't those snowflakes absolutely beautiful? And do you know what? They are. And they look so white and they look so perfect. And yet, for a snowflake to form, it takes right at the center of it a little small piece of dust and the snowflake builds around it. So no matter how white they look, right in the middle of it, there's that little bit of dust. And you know, if you go on to the next slide, snowflakes, the experts tell us there is no snowflake exactly the same. Now the next time there's snow, if you're sitting looking out and you look at all the snow and you go, every single one of those is different. And you think of how wonderful God's creation is. Some people would say it was an accident. But in our Bible, we read, in the beginning, God created he created everything absolutely everything next slide just shows a different design on the snowflake they are part of God's wonderful tremendous creation and yet right in the middle there's a little bit of dust it's just not perfect. Boys and girls, whenever people look at your life, they may say, oh, isn't so-and-so perfect? 
we got a new baby into our house, new grandson, a few months ago, and you just look and you go, oh, isn't he perfect? And then he cries because nobody's looking after him. Nobody will teach him how to do things that are wrong. But he'll be able to do things that are wrong just like you. Because right down in each of our lives, there is sin. And you know what? When we read about snow in the Bible, we read about sin. In Psalm 51 and verse 7, it says, Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. If you had a white car and the snow came, your car doesn't look awfully white because of the brilliance of the snow. And yet, it has that dust in it. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 it says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. When we see the snow, it is, looks absolutely beautiful. It is a wonder of creation, those snowflakes. And yet they're not just perfect. There's a little bit of dust or grit right in there. And the Bible tells us that we are not perfect, whether it's boys and girls or whether it's the big people, because each of us have sin in our lives. And we need something to cleanse us from our sin. And in the Bible, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ coming was born in the manger as we were celebrating just a little while ago. But he went and died on a cross of Calvary for our sins. He rose again. He's in heaven and he's coming back. But the one thing that can take away sin, it says in the Bible, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Boys and girls, as you look out, maybe we may not see any more snow this winter. But when you think of just the little imperfections in it, can I ask you to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, if you ask him into your life and into your heart, that wash me and all your sins, no matter how bad they've been, I shall be whiter than snow. I hope when you see the snow, you think about that. Next week, I think we'll probably do about rain. What do you think? Yeah, I think we will. Just remember the lesson that you see from the snow. And I hope and trust that early in life you will give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be whiter, whiter than snow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, just now we'll take a few moments to go through the announcements. The Sunday school and Bible class at 3.30 this afternoon and then the gospel meeting this evening at 7 o'clock preceded by a time of prayer in the upper room at 6.30 and our preacher this evening, uh, again, is our good brother, Jim Hudson, and the soloist expected is George Graham. Bible study tomorrow at 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. Joshua Truesdale will be along to bring us another uh, of his series, his uh, messages on the series, The Spiritful Life, taken from Romans chapter 8. We've really benefited and appreciated uh, his ministry over the last number of weeks and I would encourage you to come along if you can 8 o'clock tomorrow night Joshua Truesdale children's meeting Wednesday evening at 6.30 Thursday at 8pm the assembly prayer meeting Friday morning 10am Mums and Tots 
and then engage and re-engage with the young people next Saturday evening or having a special evening. They're going to the ice hockey meeting at 6.15 p.m. at the activity centre and have been told to announce that payment for same is required today. That brings us round to next Lord's Day in the will of the Lord. We break bread at 10.30, 11.30 our family service, 7 o'clock the gospel service, and our preacher, God willing, will be Victor Maxwell and the singer's blessed assurance. Just a couple of special announcements again. Uh, our AGM will be fast upon us on February, Tuesday, the 14th of February. Uh, and we would ask that the leaders of each of the, the works within the assembly would make sure that they have their reports for inclusion in the AGM booklet with Peter Ritchie no later than tomorrow, please. Refresher training on child safeguarding will be taking place on Tuesday the 31st of January and Wednesday the 8th of February at 8 p.m. in the Activity Centre. That's for all those involved in ministry and work with children and youth in our assembly uh, required to attend one of those sessions either on Tuesday the 31st of January or Wednesday the 8th of February at 8 p.m. in the Activity Centre. If you need any further information, please tie up with Hugh Martin. Now I think these are all of the necessary, necessary announcements and as ever they're made subject to the sovereign will of God. Now before Jem comes to preach to us, uh, we're going to sing a chorus, a change in chorus. Jem has requested that we sing uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Uh, during this hymn, the children may leave for Children's Church. Thank you. again and uh, and uh, it was great to uh, be the Apostle Paul uh, or Saul of Tarsus as we started off and uh, I need to ask forgiveness of a number of people who were helping there uh, particularly George uh, where's George this morning Oh, he's up there, he's out there, he's gone, okay, he's heard me and he's gone, and okay, and well, he was Silas who was by my side, and uh, as we were there with the kids, and we were there with the jailer, and he came and gave us a good old beating, a good whipping, uh, you got some really soft guys in this church, there was uh, Mark, and who else was there, there was, uh, uh, who else was there, the, j- the, uh, the jailer, Philippi? Colin, yeah, he was as soft as, oh dear me, okay, uh, um, but uh, anyhow, he could have given us more of a beating, but uh, G- George and me, we took it, okay, uh, we were real troopers, weren't we, George? 
And, uh, well, uh, he had to have a bit of abuse from me as we were there in the stocks and we were explaining to the kids how we'd had this beating and uh, talked, to, uh, talked about the suffering that we'd gone through. But then uh, we thought about the Lord Jesus and the suffering that he went through on the cross and we cheered up no end. And uh, anyway, we began to praise God. We even began to sing. And, and I would say to the kids, would you like to hear us sing? And they'd say, yes. Well, I said, you've not heard Silas sing. We won't put you through that. So uh, anyhow, he's been singing out there in the foyer so he could sing to his heart's content. Uh, it doesn't matter how good or, or not he is. Take that off the video, can you? Okay. Uh, but anyhow, there we go. But hey, it's been great to be with you. Great to see uh, 600 and something children going through the Bible exhibition and uh, learning uh, of how the message of Jesus spread there in the first century AD. Uh, just reading Colossians uh, a week or two ago, uh, just uh, looking at how he was able to, to uh, talk there about the gospel going uh, to all over the world. And no wonder the Apostle Paul was expecting the Lord to return at any moment. Uh, because uh, through him and others, the gospel had spread far and wide already at that time. And, uh, well, uh, as we stand here in uh, 2023, the Lord still hasn't come for his own. Uh, uh, he's, still, uh, he's still giving opportunity in this age of grace uh, for sinners to be saved. And uh, what is the job of the church? What is the job of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Iron Hall uh, here today? It's to get this message out, isn't it? into this community. Wonderful to see Danielle here. And, uh, well, uh, let's pray that there might be more Daniels in this community and uh, more people that are being reached with the gospel because it's the only hope for this world. And uh, we're not meant to be a holy huddle. We're not meant to be isolated. We're meant to be insulated from the world in which we live and uh, to be a blessing to those uh, around us. So uh, with these uh, thoughts in mind, let's, uh, let's uh, have a look at, uh, at uh, Hebrews chapter 8. and uh, Sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse uh, 8. And uh, the life of Abraham. And back home, we uh, run a Just Looking course. For those who know the work of New Tribes Mission, we used to do the 50-session uh, Creation to Christ with Unbelievers. And I would never say it was 50 weeks long, but by the time we got to week nine, uh, we got to God made Eve. And uh, then even the most pagan amongst them realized it was going to be a long time before we got to Jesus. And, uh, well, we saw a lot of blessing through that. Then uh, John Cross from Good Seed wrote The Stranger on the Road to Emmaus, and we managed to squeeze it into 16 weeks. And again, we had uh, some uh, amazing times uh, there uh, uh, sharing the... Uh, the, the truth from God's word with unbelievers and uh, from all backgrounds, and uh, that was wonderful. Just recently, if you remember the panorama of the Bible, there used to be a book about this, uh, about this long, about that wide, and you turn over the page and you go through the ages uh, in uh, this world, and well, there was 12, or 11, 11 uh, slides, basically, and uh, well, recently we've been doing that, and uh, it's been wonderful to take an ex-para from Afghanistan and his partner through, uh, through those, uh, through those, uh, those uh, sessions. And uh, just at the, uh, as we got to the 10th uh, uh, session on the life of Jesus, so from the birth of Christ to the ascension, uh, as he uh, heard what Jesus had done for him there on the cross, he went away stunned. And he was amazed at what God had done uh, for him. And, uh, well, it really is wonderful, isn't it, being involved uh, in uh, God's work and uh, being uh, those who are able to, to share the wonderful news of the gospel uh, with those uh, around us. And uh, as we're going through these slides, you come to the age of promise, when God promises Abraham there in Genesis uh, chapter 12 certain things. And how Abraham responded to God's call and to God's uh, word uh, there in those times. Let's read how Hebrews, uh, how Hebrews uh, speaks of uh, Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place uh, which he would afterwards receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs <coughs> uh, with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. 
By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his uh, bones. And so uh, this morning, uh, this morning, I want to uh, speak in uh, about three, uh, three periods of time in this world's uh, history. Uh, first of all, the world that then was, that Peter speaks about. Then the world that is now, that we're living in. And then the world uh, that is uh, to come. And I wonder this, uh, this morning, the challenge uh, to us as believers, what world are we living for and uh, in, our, in our times As at other times through history, it's very easy to be sucked in to living uh, in uh, this world and uh, being uh, entertained by the things of this world and being taken up with the things of earth. Uh, Just recently, we've gone through COVID, and you have to be very careful about speaking about COVID because it really was very divisive, wasn't it, in our churches as well as uh, out there in the community. Uh, But uh, we see how that it was quite true, wasn't it, that there were believers... Uh, There were believers who were very scared of dying through COVID. And uh, yet uh, for the believer, as far as Paul was concerned, to live, he would uh, live for uh, for the Lord Jesus and uh, he would live his life for him. But to die, he saw it as gain. He'd be with Christ. And yet uh, perhaps as we went through that period of time, maybe uh, maybe it was just questioning what we were living for. And sometimes the things of this world uh, have a hold on us. And uh, yes, we were born to live. But when we've come to know Christ, we know that uh, our future is secure. And one day we're going to be with him and we're going to be like him. We're going to be as he is. We have a wonderful future. And uh, well, let's not get so attached to this world that we just want to hang on for as long as possible. Hey, the Lord knows when the time is right for us to go home. And, uh, well, we all ought to be looking for that moment when the Lord comes for his own, when he comes for the church, and he snatches away out of this world and will be forever with the Lord. Is that the kind of thing that you're looking forward to? And uh, here at uh, the Iron Hall, I know that you, uh, you love the scriptures, you love the word of God, and you love uh, these things. But I wonder in our personal day-to-day lives, are we those who actually, it's a very different story. The things of earth are very much in our focus. And uh, th- those are the things that uh, 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 we're holding on to. Well, let's have a look at this first, uh, this first uh, 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 part in this world's history. In uh, 2 Peter, uh, Peter uh, speaks about the world that then was, and it was the time before uh, the flood. He says this, They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out, of, uh, out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to, dis- to destroy the ancient world with a mighty uh, flood. And Peter there in his second uh, letter 
He draws our attention to how the people of the world were living before the flood. Uh, it's interesting that our first parents, uh, they lived in the Garden of Eden. And uh, God had created them to have a relationship with him. And we see how God was able to communicate uh, with them. And uh, there they were in the age of innocence. And God had given them just one rule to obey. And there came uh, the deceiver. There came the enemy of God, the enemy of our souls, uh, Satan the devil. And he came and he questioned the word of God. And then later he outright denied it. And he deceived Eve. And Adam, who was standing by her, her side, who should have known better, uh, he went along with it. And so our first parents, they blew it there in the Garden of Eden and they sinned uh, against God and sin entered uh, into uh, the world. And we see how that throughout this world's history, at the end of a particular age, it's then that God comes in in judgment. And there in the age of innocence, when Adam and Eve sinned, we see how that God drove them out of the Garden of Eden in judgment. Why? Because there was the tree of life that was there, also in the Garden of Eden. And if man and uh, woman, if Adam and Eve had taken of the fruit of that tree, they'd have lived forever in their sin, separated from a holy God. And, uh, well, that wasn't what God wanted. No, 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 no. And God, as well as cursing this, uh, this world, we see how that God gave the promise of the seed of the woman that would deliver us from the power of Satan, the power of sin, and the power of death. It's the world that then was, and that was during the age uh, of innocence. But then after this time, we have the next uh, period of history, which is the age of innocence. And uh, there was no rules to obey. There was just conscience, a God-given conscience. And we see how that there was, yes, there was no Ten Commandments, but we see how that uh, man lived for himself. And, well, we see how that he rebelled against the Lord. And we go through the generations and throughout those generations uh, from Abel who died and then Seth and so on, there's a number of generations and there were those who were, who were living for God, who were different. Uh, we come to the time of Enoch and we see how that one day as Enoch went out, he was, he was taken up, he was snatched up. Uh, he never died, he went to heaven without dying. What a picture of what will happen next in God's program, in God's calendar. There'll be, uh, there'll be the church snatched up, caught up to be forever with the, uh, with the Lord. And well, there was old Enoch there who walked with God for 300 years after the uh, birth of Methuselah. And uh, yet, as you looked around in those times, these were times of great rebellion where man did his own thing. And uh, well, we see how that there was violence over all the earth. And the heart of God was broken as he looked at this scene. This scene where he had uh, created a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, world, a wonderful environment, and yet sin had spoilt it all. And there in Genesis 6, we see how the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought uh, or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And as the Lord looks on this scene today, as he looked at, looks at his world, this world that now is ruled by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Satan and uh, the God of this world who has blinded the eyes of those who don't believe. What a sorry state it's in. And we see how that, yes, violence, and we see that, don't we, on our news screens. And uh, we see uh, the world uh, as, uh, that then was is uh, very near to what the world now is. And uh, we see how that there in that time before the flood, it broke uh, the Lord's heart. And so the flood came and destroyed the ancient world, apart from those who by faith uh, entered uh, uh, the ark, uh, the God, the God's provision uh, to save uh, those who, uh, who trusted him. And so that was the world uh, that, uh, that was. But uh, let's have a look at the world that now is. Uh, and when Noah and his family came out of the ark, God said, look, uh, multiply, have lots of kids, fill the whole earth with people. And, uh, well, uh, we see how that this was the age of human government. And uh, government is ordained by God. 
And we see all the way through the Old Testament, we uh, look at the, uh, the Assyrians and we look at the Babylonians. And uh, we see how that there in Daniel it speaks about the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. And he gives it to whomsoever he will. And so uh, God is still sovereign and God uh, allows people to rule in this world. And uh, God will bring about his purposes and his plans to fulfillment. And uh, we see how that he was able in the Old Testament times to use the Persian uh, uh, king Cyrus to give the decree that God's people, the Jews, should return and uh, to, uh, to build the, uh, the temple. And so uh, we see how that, yes, uh, in the ages in the world that we call, uh, that now is, we see how that, yes, uh, God uh, acted uh, in uh, particular ways. And uh, we see how that in the age of human government, which covers the time of the, uh, the, of, uh, the Tower of Babel, when people, instead of spreading out, they stayed in one place. And we see there how that uh, they were rebelling against God, going in direct opposition to the word of God, which was to fill the whole earth with people. They were staying in one place. And so God comes down. And he brings in all the languages, and so the people spread out over uh, all the earth. Human government didn't work, uh, work, work then. And throughout time, we've seen how that, yes, governments, the governments of this world are, are, are ordained by God. And, uh, and uh, well, uh, we're told to pray for our governments, for our leaders. Uh, but uh, we can't change it. We're living in uh, the world that now is. And, uh, well, uh, we can try and get involved in all these things. But there's something better that we can be involved in that will make a real difference. And so uh, we see how that uh, after Genesis uh, chapter 11, we see right at the end of, uh, of that uh, time, uh, we see how that we're introduced to a character who is called the father of all those that believe. The father of all those uh, who uh, believe. And from that moment... We see how that things haven't changed uh, too much. Satan is still the god of this world. Satan is uh, still the one who blinds the eyes of those who uh, don't uh, believe. But into this scene, we see how that with human government that rebelled against God, we see how that there's the age of promise. And we're introduced to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, the Hebrew people. And uh, he is uh, an incredible character. And uh, God tells us what he's like, warts and all. And, well, he's a man who's just like us. But, uh, hey, I wonder, uh, as uh, you look at uh, Abraham's Bible, I wonder how well you would cope. What Bible did Abraham have? Well, as we look at our first uh, books, uh, well, they're written by Moses. Abraham didn't have much of a Bible, but the things that God communicated him to him, he took to heart. And he realized that the one who's speaking uh, to him was the Almighty. And uh, from, from an idolatrous background, Abraham comes to put his faith, his trust in the living God. And as Hebrews uh, tells us there, there are things that, well, we can even say there are things that even as today, there are promises that are unfulfilled. But even though Abraham died and Isaac died and Jacob died, the promise that, uh, promises that God had made to them, they hung to those promises. They recognized that this was the word of God and God never fails uh, to keep uh, his promises. This was wonderful faith. And I wonder this morning, as we have Genesis to Revelation, have we got that great faith that Abraham had? That every word in this book, is true because it's God's word and we see how that yes God will do all that he has promised to do and yes there are still things unfinished there are still things that God promised to Abraham that are still unfulfilled God cannot lie and so he must fulfill all of those things and uh, we see how that there are unfulfilled things concerning the church and uh, yes the Bible tells us uh, much about end times and you had David Moore with you a few uh, months ago uh, speaking about these things and God will uh, fulfill everything that is promised. His word is reliable. His word is trustworthy 
and uh, we, uh, uh, we're not making a mistake uh, to follow uh, this, uh, this book. And so in Genesis chapter 11, we're, we're, we're uh, introduced to this uh, character, Abraham. Romans 4 tells us he's the father of all those who believe. And uh, he worshipped idols uh, for the uh, first period of his life, for 75 years. And uh, we see that uh, when the true and living God appeared to him, uh, then uh, his life uh, was uh, very, very uh, different. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12 and uh, verse 1 there. And there in Genesis 12, 1, uh, uh, God uh, says, Therefore, since we also... Uh, so, oh, hang on, that's Hebrews 12. Uh, uh, Genesis 12. And... Uh, Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed. First, first thing, number one, go to the land that I will show you. The first of these uh, three, uh, three promises is uh, all to do with the land. And uh, up to this point in history, they've only had about 30,000 square miles. As you look further down the chapter and see where God was going to give uh, this land to Abraham and to his descendants. And uh, yet, uh, as you look at that, you work out that there's around about 300 square miles. And uh, this is what Stephen said uh, before the council in Acts chapter 7. He said, but God gave him no inheritance here, not even one square foot of land, God did promise, however, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants, even though he had no children yet. And uh, so uh, Stephen uh, went on. Uh, verse 2, he says, I'll make you a great nation. So there's the promise of the land still unfulfilled. I'll make you uh, a great uh, nation is uh, number two, the second promise. It concerns this uh, nation. Has God fulfilled that promise? He sure has. What a, what a nation. Uh, that has uh, lived on this earth. And from, uh, uh, from uh, Genesis 12, we see how that God uh, has done an amazing thing uh, uh, through uh, Abraham and uh, through uh, his uh, descendants. And uh, God has certainly brought uh, from him a great nation. There's no nation quite like, him, is, uh, like, like, like them, is there? And wherever we go in the world, we'll see a Russian Jew, a German Jew, uh, an American Jew, and they're scattered all over the planet. And they're God's people. And uh, God has fulfilled his promise to, uh, to Abraham, uh, as he always does. Verse 3 tells us, I will bless those who bless you and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth uh, shall be uh, blessed. He would make him a blessing. And as we look at this promise, God has kept his word on this. And well, included in this promise is people like you and me we see how that God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we see how that he has brought blessing to the whole world, to all nations, to all people, people like you and I uh, here uh, this morning. And so as Abraham hears the call of God and as God speaks to him, uh, he has a choice. And Abraham chooses to believe God, to take God at his word, and we see how that in verse 4, Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Uh, hey, but Lot went with him. And uh, his father Terah died as well. And uh, hey, uh, it was kind of uh, at the halfway house, really. Uh, he took uh, some family members uh, with him. And uh, they were a bit of a hindrance uh, to him. Down to verse uh, 7. Uh, we see how that but then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared uh, to uh, him. Notice what happens when Abraham obeys. God, as you look at the, uh, uh, the story, he didn't speak to Abraham in Haran. And there he was delayed with his father, uh, Terah. But when he gets into the land that God had spoken to him uh, uh, about, uh, we see how that Abraham, the first thing he does is he builds an altar. And uh, that was his testimony to God. And, and the people who were living in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, they were a, pers a cursed people. Look back uh, in uh, Genesis uh, chapter, I think it's five. 
And we see how that Canaan was cursed. And so already in this promised land, there's people who are, who are sinning greatly and Satan has uh, 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 spoilt uh, this uh, scene. And yet Abraham builds an altar there and he worships uh, the Lord. And uh, he not- noticed how he lived in tents. Uh, he recognized that this world was not his home. He was just passing through uh, as, a, as a pilgrim, like a foreigner uh, in the land. And there was something else that had caught the grasp uh, of Abraham that was more important to him. But as we look at this wonderful man of faith, we see that Abraham's faith wasn't always strong. There were times when Abraham's faith wavered. And uh, we uh, read of that in uh, chapter uh, Uh, Chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe uh, in uh, the land. And what a mistake that was. Did God tell Abraham to go to to Egypt? No. Uh, And we see that this isn't the only time when Abraham starts to, uh, to, uh, to do things of his own accord, of his own will. And he finds himself out of the will of God. And uh, whenever we go out of the will of God, we find that it's a huge mistake. God hadn't told him to go. This was Abraham's decision. Abraham didn't believe God at this point and trust God to provide for his needs. And so he goes down into the land of Egypt. And we see how that the land of Egypt was always seen as a picture of this world with uh, all that it offers, uh, its, uh, its pleasures, its uh, sinful pleasures and, uh, uh, and so on. And, uh, well, it's always a, a picture of something that is bad. And uh, that goes all the way through the Bible. And Abraham went down to Egypt, it tells us. But we see how there came a point, after getting in a mess... And God steps into that mess and brings him out along with Sarai's, uh, Sarah's wife. We see how that, uh, that Abraham goes back to the place where he departed. And that's a lesson for us all, isn't it? And as we go on our journey of faith, trusting the Lord Jesus and living for him, there are moments when we make our own choices and uh, we get off track uh, and we deviate from how the Lord Jesus wants us to live. And well, when we come to that, our senses, what does God want us to do? He wants us to get back on track by simply, by simply going back to the place of departure. And 1 John 1 and verse 9 uh, tells us, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, when we've gone into this world and when we become part of this world and, uh, uh, and, all, uh, and taken part in its, uh, its devices and so on, hey, there is a way back. Uh, and we uh, can be restored. Uh, and God wants us to be recovered and restored. And he's made provision for that. And so uh, we see how that, yes, uh, uh, Abraham went into Egypt. Interestingly, Lot went with him. Lot never recovered, did he? And as you read the Old Testament, uh, as you read the book of Genesis, you would hardly believe that Lot was a a believer. There he was, the things of this world, he saw the green uh, pastures there. Hey, that would be good for business. That would be good for uh, my wealth. Uh, My wealth will increase. And so Abraham said, all right, you go that way, I'll go to this scrubland. God was able to bless Abraham in the scrubland. And uh, that wasn't the focus of Abraham's life, but God blessed him with all those things too. Lot went down uh, to the uh, plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's not long before he's in Sodom. And, uh, well, is he a testimony there in Sodom? No. They, uh, when he was being dragged out by those angels, we see how Lot, uh, Lot uh, was like one who, uh, who mocked. And, uh, hey, they didn't believe him. He had no testimony at all. Why? Because he was in the world and he was a part of it. And it's only the New Testament where God the Holy Spirit uh, testifies to the fact that it vexed his righteous soul every day there in Egypt. Hey, for Christian friends today, you don't want to go into Egypt. It's a, it's a place of misery. Yes, we're offered all the pleasures of sin, but it's just for a season. Afterwards, there's emptiness. 
and uh, well, uh, uh, hey, we can come back into the loving uh, uh, arms of our Heavenly Father uh, because of what Jesus has done for them and uh, for us, and we can be restored uh, into uh, fellowship with Him. But when we go into Egypt and take others with us, some might never get out of Egypt, and that is sad, and they make shipwreck of their lives. John tells us in his letters, do not love this world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Why is the world such an enemy to the Christian? He tells us why. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does... What, God, uh, what pleases God will live forever. Paul, as he speaks in Romans chapter 12 there, he tells uh, the believers, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Are you allowing the Lord Jesus, are you allowing God to change the way you think? Not as the world thinks. Uh, and don't take what the world gives. Hey, Uh, The world that now is. Abraham lived in it. And we see how it was the age of promise. We see how that it was the age of law when Moses came and gave his Ten Commandments. And we see how that all the way up to uh, Calvary, we see how that uh, the world that now is uh, was was a very evil, uh, wicked world. So much so that we see how that they murdered the Lord Jesus. They put him on a Roman cross and they thought that they were killing him, but it was... Uh, It was God's plan before the foundation of the world that he would send a saviour into this world for lost uh, lost, uh, mankind, uh, for for, for people like us. And we see how that God uh, did what no other could do for us there on the cross uh, as he laid the sins of us all on his his, uh, beloved son. And Jesus paid the price uh, for our uh, sins. Hey, Uh, chapter 15 and verse uh, 5 we read uh, these words Uh, uh, then uh, this is uh, uh, God's covenant with Abraham and uh, he still hadn't got a son and uh, this is what he says verse 5 then he brought him outside and said look now towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them and he said to him so shall your descendants be so shall your descendants be. One, two, three, four, five. Five words about a descendant. Here was Sarah, an old wrinkly, and here was Abraham as good as dead. Impossible. Five words to cling on to and all the other promises that God had made to Abraham. And verse six is a wonderful verse. Verse 6 tells us, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? Abraham simply had just a few words to hang on to. And all the promises uh, that God had made to him, reliant on the fact that he'd have a son. He was childless. And, uh, well, we see how that God is... Uh, truly, uh, truly uh, faithful to his word and to uh, his uh, promise. Look how much we as believers have of God's word. It's all true. We can stake our lives, our reputation, everything that we have on it because his word will never, ever fail. He's the God who cannot lie. I wonder uh, how seriously we take uh, his word. Well, uh, we see how that uh, as Abraham uh, develops and uh, dinner's burning, okay? Uh, but, uh, so we won't be long now, okay? But we see how that Abraham, uh, Abraham becomes uh, known as the friend of God. James tells us that. And we see some wonderful moments in his life that the Lord uh, shared with his friend about what he was uh, about to do. Genesis 18, remember when uh, the three visitors came to, uh, to meet him at Marmara and uh, we see how that uh, two of them were angels, they went down to, uh, to Sodom and the Lord spoke with his friend, Abraham. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Abraham became the friend of God. He had a relationship with him and they, they talk, talked as friends. That's what God desires. And I wonder whether you talk with God as a, as a friend 
recently a, a well-known uh, preacher. He was questioned by his wife. And uh, he realized that, yes, he was treating the Lord just like, uh, just like a business partner. And uh, do this, do that, and all the rest of it. But was the Lord his friend? It's a very challenging thing, isn't it? Is the Lord your friend this morning? And uh, do you have a, have a relationship and you share together intimately as a friend would have a friend? Or is he someone who's distant and so on? And, uh, well, uh, here is uh, Abraham, the friend of God. And, uh, uh, and God shares with him what he's about uh, to do there in Sodom. And, uh, hey, uh, we can trust him, can't we? Because Abraham, he thought if there was 10 righteous, after coming from 50 down to 10, and, uh, well, uh, look, at the, look at the result. It was far under 10, but we see the grace of God that goes far beyond what we could ever uh, ask or think. Genesis 22. Uh, gives us uh, an insight into Abraham's fa uh, faith as, as God tests him. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering and, uh, on one of the mountains, which I'll show you. And uh, did uh, God want a dead Isaac there? No. What was the purpose of that test? The purpose of that test was God wanted Abraham's heart. And he sure got it. And we see what the workings of Abraham's mind, uh, this, uh, this, the, this living and true God who had appeared to him in Ur of the Chaldeans uh, and called him to leave his uh, family, his home, and those promises. He recon recognized that God was faithful and true to his word and that he would, even though he'd seen no resurrection, that God would have to raise the boy back to life again so that his promises could be fulfilled. What great faith Abraham had. God had his man, a man uh, who had a heart for him. And God's always looking for people with a heart. The Lord uh, knows our hearts and he knows that they're desperately wicked. And there was a later time in the time of David when he found that David was a man after his own heart. Are you a man, a woman after God's own heart? One who knows the Lord. Well, what was it uh, that uh, Hebrews uh, tells of these, uh, these guys? Hebrews tells us all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. And God says this about them. God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. The world that then uh, was, the world that now is, and uh, we're still living uh, in these uh, times, but in the age of uh, grace. And uh, I wonder, as we sung earlier, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and uh, grace. Lastly, the world that is to come, Hebrews 11.10. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Is that what we're looking for this morning? And uh, hey, we don't want to be so heavenly minded that we have no earthly use. God has left us in this world, not to be part of it, but to be a witness to him and to bring others into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and the work that he did for them there on the cross that finished work uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, redemption. And, uh, well, I wonder uh, what are we uh, living for, for this world or for the world to come? Don't store up treasures uh, on earth, the Lord Jesus told us, but store up treasure in heaven. And wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your heart this morning? Is it in tune with him? Are we living for this world or for the world uh, to come? Let's be those who are not isolated. We're in the world, we're just not to be part of it. But he's left us in this world for a purpose. To be his witnesses to those who are perishing, to those who are dying. And here at the Iron Hall, we have all these estates around here. What is the church doing in seeking to win the lost for him. Time's gone. Apologies. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tonight. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we, 
We have much to thank you for. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And we pray that uh, we would uh, recognize uh, that uh, you uh, are the one who is utterly trustworthy, totally reliable. And uh, Lord, your word never fails. Thank you that there are many promises in this book that relate to us as part of the church. And uh, we thank you that you'll keep every one of them. Thank you that you're coming back, and we believe coming back soon. And uh, one day uh, you'll come and snatch us uh, away from this scene. And we'll be caught up to be uh, forever with you. And uh, you'll bring with, uh, with you those who are already fallen asleep. And uh, their bodies will be raised first. And then we'll be caught up uh, uh, with them to meet you in the clouds. We thank you for that promise. And we thank you uh, that this is, this is indeed the next, uh, uh, the next thing in your program of how, uh, how uh, things are going to work out. And Lord, we pray that we would be useful while here on earth, that we would be those who are about your business. And we pray that we would uh, allow you uh, to, uh, to live in us and through us. And we pray that uh, we would be coming more and more like Jesus day by day. But we thank you for this uh, wonderful promise that when we see you, we shall be like you. We shall be as you are. Lord, what a wonderful, glorious prospect that is. And uh, we pray that we would be ever seeking to be more like Jesus. And we thank you that uh, we're not left to, uh, to seek to live this life on our own, but we have your spirit who indwells us. We have Christ in us. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful position that is. And so we pray that we would be reminded of these things and live in the light of them. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Okay, there are some prayer letters out the back if you want to grab one of those. Tonight we'll be sharing about the uh, work that's going on and uh, also uh, about the uh, work that's going on in Ukraine with the Bible exhibitions. We hope to enter Ukraine the second week of February with a number of exhibitions and there'll be people from all over the Ukraine that will be meeting uh, to be trained up in that because there are people out there who uh, believe in God now they need to know the truth about Jesus and there's a great hunger. So a bit of that tonight, if you're able to come. Every blessing.